Okay, so our next presenter is uh, Dr. Benjamin Fuchs, and he received his um, Master in Electrical Engineering in 2004, and also received his PhD degree in Signal Processing and Telecommunications in uh, 2017 and 16 from the University of Penn. And he, um, current, his current research interests are uh, to resolve around the electromagnetic and signal processing for antenna analysis and synthesis. So let's pass the word for. Thank you. I would like to first thank uh, you for the invitation and also congratulate the whole uh, organization team for their great work, and especially uh, Bruno for his uh, tremendous implication in everything. So I'm going today to talk about some advances that we made in our lab regarding computational imaging at microwaves. Don't be scared, I will first recall what I, called, uh, what I mean by computational imaging. And this is a, a, a joint work with uh, my colleagues Christopher and Mathieu. And actually, uh, I want to stress out that that is the most of the work here. Mostly Christopher, the PhD student that can wear Avayanas even in winter. He's putting socks uh, below and, uh, and uh, supervised by Mathieu. I was mostly involved in uh, solving the inverse problem uh, that we have with uh, microwave imaging. Okay, so first microwave imaging, uh, the goal is to reconstruct an image of the scene. So it calls, uh, it's a quite com complete problem because it calls for both the design of electronic system in order to transmit and receive waves in the case of active imaging on, or only to receive waves in the case of passive imaging. It also calls for the development of signal processing algorithm in order to uh, solve the inverse problem and to reconstruct the image. It has many features and applications. So first you can have microwave imaging for short or long range uh, distances. You can have, as I said, active and passive imaging, and it uh, has applications, a lot of applications, both civil and military. I named here just a few. So for instance, you can think of remote sensing for geophysics, uh, security screening at airports uh, to detect uh, concealed weapon, for instance. Uh, also, a lot of applications in biomedical imaging, through the wall ima imaging, and so on and so forth. One key metric in uh, microwave imaging is uh, spatial resolution. So it's quite easy to understand. It's the ability to detect uh, uh, to detail on the scene. So in active imaging, we have the resolution in range, in distance, and it is uh, linked to the bandwidth uh, B of your system. So the larger the bandwidth, the better uh, your resolution. So to have a better resolution, you increase uh, the bandwidth, you try to increase the bandwidth of your system, and it often implies that you have to go higher in frequency. You also have a nazimutal uh, resolution, and R here is the distance uh, to the target, uh, from the radar to the target. Uh, this is the operating frequency, and it's inversely proportional to the aperture of uh, your system electrical aperture of your system. So if you want to have a better resolution in uh, azimuth, you need to increase the aperture uh, of your antenna. A few words on the radiation properties of material. Uh, objects, they are characterized by their emissivity, uh, epsilon. This is the ability to emit an electromagnetic wave of thermal, of thermal origin. It's also characterized by the reflectivity to reflect the electromagnetic wave and the transmissivity to be penetrated by an electromagnetic wave. Of course, all these uh, properties uh, depend on the frequency here, omega. And just to give you uh, some ideas, the metal is, of course, reflective at all frequencies. And the human body has its emissivity that changes with the frequency, and we can say it uh, increases uh, uh, with a uh, frequency. So in active imaging, you are sending, you are emitting a wave, and then you are listening, you are recording the echo from a scene, and in that case, you can make a map of the reflectivity of the scene. Reflectivity, it can be seen, seen as a scattering trends of a scene. 
So some advantages of active imaging, it's usually you can expect to have a good signal to noise ratio because you are emitting a wave. So if you emit sufficiently well, you should receive something. And also you have a resolution in range, in distance, that as I said before, is linked to the bandwidth of your system. So you can discriminate two objects that are on the same uh, direction. The problem is you have to emit a wave and it can be costly or it can be uh, painful uh, if you emit a too strong wave. So, uh, and uh, you can be detected also if you emit a wave. In passive in imaging, in the contrary, you just uh, record uh, what you are, you just listen to the scene and you can have an image of the thermal noise of a scene. So you make a map of the emissivity uh, of the scene. So you work in receiving mode. The advantage is if you have no emission, so it's completely harmless and stealth. The problem is often you are dealing very, with very low received level and uh, you need very sensitive uh, sensors. Okay, so let me first present a few uh, classical RF imaging systems before introducing the computational imaging. So one well-known approach is a synthetic aperture radar, SAR. In that case, you have uh, one sensor that is here embedded uh, on, a, on a plane, but it can be uh, something different. And uh, you move this one sensor to scan uh, the scene and to see your target with different angle of incidence. So it's interesting in that case because you have only one RF chain for the emission and one RF chain for the reception, so it's relatively cheap. The problem is that it's time consuming because you have to move this sensor and it can also be costly to move a sensor. Okay. In a MIMO system, we talked about it earlier, you have a, an array for transmitting a wave and receiving it. And it's great because it enables you to have a important spatial diversity and it end, you end up having usually a very good resolution. The problem is it can be quite hard and costly to implement because you need one RF chain per antenna. So it becomes, massive MIMO becomes quite complicated from the hardware point of view to implement. <coughs> so this is my transition to introduce you to computational imaging. So in compressive sensing, uh, there is a new paradigm. So we, we can, uh, it has been shown that we can uh, sample a signal below uh, the Nyquist uh, rate. So the Nyquist rate, to sample a signal properly, to be sure to reconstruct it well, you need to sample it with twice uh, the bandwidth of the signal. With compressive sensing, provided of course some assumptions, uh, you can expect to have less measurements than pixel to image because we are in the imaging uh, um, problem here. So can we use this in order to simplify imaging uh, system architectures? So here I borrowed uh, these uh, figures from two uh, papers that are mm, referring uh, to optics, but we will see that we can translate it to, to a lower frequency microwaves later. So typically, the traditional system, you want to image this object and you need more or less as many sensors as pixel to image. Okay. You can see it also like this with your lens and you have one sensor. You move your sensor uh, behind your lens and you have one spot that is moving in order to image each pixel uh, of, your, uh, of your scene. Okay. Um, it has been proposed, uh, I think, uh, 15 years ago now by people from Rice University in the state, uh, this principle of single pixel camera. In that case, you have only one sensor, and in front of this sensor, you place a mask. And uh, you change uh, different mask, and it enables you to, only, with only one sensor, to reconstruct the scene. So practically, it's not of uh, great interest, because uh, as we discussed uh, yesterday, uh, cameras are quite cheap, so, but it was just a very interesting proof of concept to show that in that case you need less mask also than pixel to image. So we can see that there is uh, something here. The same analogy if you look at the lens, you will change your uh, optical uh, uh, grating here and with uh, one uh, illumination uh, you will, uh, you will uh, 
uh, illuminate the scene with all these spots, and then you change your mask with another random max, and is as if you were looking at the scene with a different angle. Okay. So instead of uh, this uh, mask, what you can use is a multiple scattering medium, and in that case, you will have a few sensors behind and still smaller number than uh, the number of pixels to image, or in microarrays, what you could use is only one sensor and a device, I will come back to this later, that will provide you different uh, patterns here, that will radiate different patterns depending on the frequency. So in that case, you have one sensor, this compressive uh, device, frequency diverse device, and you will be able to acquire different image of your scene. So, I come up with uh, new figures to explain the same thing. Traditional uh, approaches such as uh, MIMO, you have an array of antenna, one RF chain uh, behind each antenna, and uh, you image pixel by pixel. And we want to replace it by a compressive uh, device here, only one output or two. And at one frequency, we will illuminate this pixel. At another frequency, another set of pixels. And we will use all these combinations in order to reconstruct our scene. So in some way, we have replaced the spatial diversity by a frequency diversity here. And we send a sequence of spatially diverse pattern in order to illuminate our scene and to reconstruct our pattern. The good point here is that we don't have any more N RF chains, but only one. It's low cost, of course, in, for that reason, and we don't have to, to scan the scene like in a SAR radar, so it's fast. The problem is that we need to calibrate well to know well our compressive device here, so for the input we need to know exactly our output. And the post-processing is a bit more heavy than traditional, uh, the other conventional approaches. But with this computational imaging, uh, let's say, a strategy, we have transferred the burden of imaging from hardware here to software. Okay, the question now is how to do this uh, frequency diverse, how to do this compressive device that will link this output, this one RF chain, to, uh, to the radiating part. So some people in Duke University in the United States have proposed metasurface, frequency di diverse apertures, and they are composed of sub-wavelength resonators. These are small resonators that have all different resonating frequency. And with this, by changing the frequency, they will illuminate a scene with uncorrelated frequency patterns. We are using uh, what we call leaky chaotic cavity. Leaky because it's opened a bit. There are some holes in order to radiate something. And it's a chaotic cavity, so it's a, an oversized box uh, in which we have random modes propagating inside the box, and uh, for different frequencies, we are uh, emitting differently, uh, different patterns that are uncorrelated. Okay, so I will come back to this box later, but a bit of mathematics here to see, to explain you how we perform the imaging from a computational point of view. So, we have our chaotic cavity, chaotic box. There is here two uh, inputs, and we have a horn illuminating, illuminating our scene. So the wave goes from the horn uh, to the scene. This is uh, the green function to compute the propagation of the waves to the horns from the scene. Then the wave is, uh, is uh, reflected by the scene. This is uh, sigma, the reflectivity of the scene. This is our unknown. We want to reconstruct sigma. Then the wave is propagated back uh, to the cavity, this green function here, and then we have the transfer function of the cavity that we know that we have to, char to characterize, to calibrate, to um, know th how the field propagates from this surface to the ports. Okay. And we just record on one of these ports, i is the number of the port, one or two, uh, the function of the frequency. We have a vector here, this is our sensing matrix A, that is uh, random, that depends on the frequency and then the number of colons depends on the, on the scene, the position on the scene, and our unknown here is the sigma 
the reflectivity of the scene, the image that we want to do. So we have a linear system that we want to invert. So then we can use uh, many approaches, time reversal. Uh, this is the uh, Hermitian matrix, the conjugate transpose. We can just inverse this matrix. If it's uh, well posed uh, or not, we, uh, there are various approaches to do the inversion, for instance, truncated SVD. <coughs> or we can use more elaborated approaches, regularized inversion methods, if we have some prior on the scene. So often we can say that a scene is quite sparse because think of it, uh, we need to perform an image at a given radius. So for instance, if I want to compute the number of people at a given radius uh, away from me, uh, it's a sparse problem. So in that case, we have a data fidelity term here this is uh, basically the noise level. And we can minimize different norms. If we minimize the norm two, it's like Tikhonov regularization. Norm one, we will uh, foster sparse, uh, problem, sparse solutions. And the TV norm, it's, uh, we apply the sparsity on the, on the gradient. OK, so this is how we solve our imaging problem. So now I move to what we, we did in our lab. We build a leaky chaotic cavity. This is a metallic box that is leaky because uh, there are holes, there is an aperture that radiates something or listens something. So this cavity is quite big in terms of wavelengths. So it's 16 by 16 a lambda. And you can see that we have added some hemisphere, metallic hemisphere, in order to break any symmetry and to render the cavity as chaotic as possible. We want to have a lot of modes and, uh, that are radiating inside. So if you are applying this veil low, you can estimate the number of modes inside this cavity to be above 50K, which is quite uh, a lot. And then a tricky point is how you choose uh, the size of the holes. Ideally, you want them as small as possible because you want your cavity to be uh, very selective in frequency. But if you drill them very small, then nothing will radiate. So it's a compromise between the radiation efficiency and the Q factor of this quality, the size of the holes. OK. Uh, an important uh, metric to characterize this cavity is, as often in this system, is the number of degrees of freedom. Here, we are dealing with frequency, so it is the spectral number of degrees of freedom, n omega. So n omega depends on the bandwidth of the systems and the spectral length correlation. OK. And we can also compute it like this. So if you have a very high number of degrees of freedom, then you will have a very good image, basically. So if you look at this formula, what you want is a large bandwidth, a large delta omega, and or better, and, but if you cannot, you want a high quality factor. So our, for our cavity, we have estimated the spectral uh, length of correlation to 3 megahertz. So we deduced to the, uh, so we know delta omega, so we deduced the Q factor to this value. And we have about uh, more than a thousand number of degrees of freedom. So can we check that in practice? Yes. If we can, uh, we record the field transmitted between the aperture um, of the, between, sorry, the aperture of the cavity and uh, the output port of the box. So we placed a probe in front of uh, one of the, the hole, and we send a, a signal by one of the ports, and we, lo we look at the field that is coming at the function of the frequency. And we can see that this field varies a lot. There are a lot of fluctuation in both amplitude and phase. So this somehow translates that we have an important scattering inside the box. Uh, more accurate, if we now uh, record uh, the near field at the outside of the box at different frequencies, and if we make the correlation between them, we can see that we end up with a diagonal matrix, which means that if we have two different frequencies, there is no correlation. Another way to see it, now we propagate the f this field at the outside of the box to a distance on our scene that we want to image, and if we look at the impinging uh, electromagnetic wave. This is uh, the pattern that we get. So they are varying a lot at different frequencies. And also one thing to point out is that we don't have a focus beam 
uh, as traditionally for imaging system, but we have the power that is quietly spread, which is important because we would like to image the whole scene. Okay, so some uh, experimental results. Uh, we have done that in our library, so it's not the best possible environment, but it's, it's working. Of course, we had not one, but two, uh, two metallic uh, spheres here. They were placed in far field at half a meter away from, uh, you can see the emitting horn here. We have a VNA that is uh, between this emitting horn and the output port of the box. Previously, we have characterized our box. We have the transfer function of our box. We know it. And this is what we construct during, uh, using three uh, inversion procedure, time reversal, matrix inversion, or L1 minimization. So this is the result for punctual targets. If we look at uh, L-shaped uh, extended targets, these are the results uh, also uh, that we obtain, and in that case for active uh, computational imaging because we are sending a wave. Okay, I move now to passive computational imaging because we use the same box to perform some passive imaging. So first, some uh, reminders, passive imaging with a ram radiometer. So you are recording remotely, of course, thermal noises radiated by a scene. So you can discriminate objects from their emissivity, from their ability to uh, emit a thermal noise. Of course, it requires very directive antenna if you want a good resolution. Okay. In our case, uh, the philosophy is different. We have the same box and we are using, if you want, a coherent interferometric processing. Okay. So we do the cross-correlation of the noise signal recording by only these two channels. Okay? We have these two channels here, and we do the cross-correlation, and we see that the cross-correlation depends on uh, here the equivalent noise. It can be linked to the thermal noise. This is a Boltzmann constant, and we end up again having an inverse problem to solve, like the previous one. Okay? So um, some first, some numerical validation. So we are using the transfer function of the cavities that has been measured, but as a target, we put synthetic uh, data. So here you have a first example, here a second example. This is a reference using time reversal inversion and using truncated SVD. So the, the, these targets, they are the pixel source, they are Gaussian noises just to see that it's working fairly well using the truncated SVD. And now uh, we move to measurements. How did we do to emulate a thermal noise, a punctual thermal noise? We just use a horn and we connected it to an amplifier having a high thermal noise. So in that case, we have one or two punctual targets. And these are the results using Tikhonov regularization. So we can see uh, the two uh, position, and if we look, if we use L1 minimization, it's uh, very, the results are very spectacular because we have only one pixel here that corresponds to this one, and one pixel here. It's a very favorable problem for uh, sparse recovery because uh, it's a very sparse scene. That's why it's working so well here. Now, if we look at uh, the SNR, the signal to noise ratio. Uh, which is a um, uh, metric often used to uh, assess the quality of the reconstruction, with respect to the number of frequency, we can see that it increases as the square root of the number of frequency, and then it saturates, but the saturation arrives exactly when we are uh, going beyond our number of uh, uh, degrees of freedom, which is as expected, because then the frequency start to be correlated so we cannot uh, have new information. Okay, last example for passive computational imaging, this time with extended noise sources, we used commercial, uh, commercial fluorescent uh, lamps that are known to radiate a broadband microwave noise in this uh, frequency range. And um, we, are able, we are able here to discriminate also the polarization of, uh, of the target. Okay, so here we see that uh, in this example, this is the co-polarization, the cross-polarization. The fluorescent lamp were placed like this and then horizontally here. So we can also have the information on the polarization. 
Okay, conclusion. Uh, computational imaging is a, a very promising solution for the design of fast and low-cost imaging system. It has been already developed by uh, uh, several universities in the uh, United States. Uh, we would like to go uh, to achieve higher resolution, of course, which implies larger bandwidths, and for that we will go from uh, uh, X-band, so around 10 gigahertz to millimeter wave, around 60, I think, to have uh, these uh, larger uh, bandwidths. Um, also, with the higher frequency, you can have a better contrast for passive imaging applications. And um, a key point we want to investigate it in the future is to, it's to look at solutions in order to avoid the uh, time-consuming scanning of the chaotic uh, cavity. Um, if you want, there are more details in our uh, published paper here, and uh, Christopher will be submitting soon his, uh, his thesis, so I would like to thank him because I took... Uh, a lot of results from his PhD. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank, thank you for the presentation. So if you have any questions. Very interesting um, uh, solution for the, the imaging problem. Uh, just a question. Uh, you use the probe to characterize the, uh, the cavity. Yes. Is it possible to use near field measurements and then to back propagate the, uh, the field on the aperture uh, in order to do a faster measurements or characterization? You mean far field measurements? Yes. And, and back propagate? Back propagate. Yes, this is what we, we are thinking to do that uh, in the future. So far, we are uh, scanning the near field. Uh, of the probe, but another approach will be uh, to measure the cavity in the far field and to back propagate. Mm -hmm. But perhaps we will lose some information by doing this back propagation. Okay, so, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? One question about the probe. Uh, when you design a probe, you have some kind of uh, mode selectivity, and you want a multi-mode, as many modes as you want in your cavity. The mm -hmm. position, the size, the design. So how did you manage to have, uh, to be able to, have, to, how can I say, to suck energy so, from so many modes with only one uh, probe at one place? No, no. Uh I was not very clear when I explained uh, then how we characterize our cavity. So we place a VNA here. We are emitting a wave inside the cavity. And with another port, we are putting an open-ended waveguide. And we scan what is going out for each frequency. So it's an open-ended waveguide. Yes. And we scan what is going out for each frequency. And yeah. we can do both for both polarization of the field. Okay, yeah. but even though you open ended wave, that has a mode selectivity. Uh, so, how did you manage uh, our manage open, to our open ended wave guide? Is, has a quite a broadband uh, uh, behavior. So, for each frequency, we record uh, the complex field that is radiated by the cavity. Okay. There is no mode in uh, story, the modes are inside the cavity. No, Here, we are just recording outside the cavity, in the near field of the cavity, what is going out. Okay, and I'll discuss with you at the break. No worries. <laughs> I got more questions on that. Okay. Any more questions? No? So uh, I have just uh, one more sort of curiosity. Is you use a uh, lamp that it, it is known to emit yeah. Uh, at, at 10 gigahertz, would you also consider using some, for example, 2.4 gigahertz, where you have a lot of Wi-Fi signals being emitted? Um, I'd, I'm, I'm not sure that the Wi-Fi signal could be considered as a, a thermal uh, a noise. It wouldn't work. What we were planning, what we are planning to use, is to use the thermal radiation of a human body. 
but it's uh, at 10 gigahertz, the frequency is too low to have something significant. We have to go at, uh, I think it's around 90 gigahertz. Because then you can uh, image a metal, uh, because the metal uh, it doesn't emit anything, uh, while your body emits something. So this is why you can detect, uh, for instance, uh, a weapon. But you have to go higher in frequency for that. Okay. Thanks. Questions? Okay, so let's thank him again. Now we have a, a break. So thanks. <laughs>